what you're about to see here, uh, no, nobody else has seen it, except maybe maybe your heads of state and people that are privy to the information. Good day to all of you here, our one big family. I just want to say that I am humbled and grateful for your friendships, which is why I practice my due diligence and work to bring you substantial content that others just are either afraid to share or just too lazy and don't know anything about research or what investigative journalism is. Investigative journalism brings out the truth a lot. And we don't just follow the news here. The news follows us, which is why I want you all to understand that what you're about to see here, uh, no, nobody else has seen it except maybe, maybe your heads of state and people that are privy to the information. But now if you have the time, I, I suggest that you take it to watch this. Uh, you'll end up knowing more about what is actually the process of things within the USA in regards to Africa and how things are going right now in a committee hearing in Congress that took place about a week ago. And I've gone through it over and over, piecing the puzzle together in here. And it isn't the easiest thing to do. I mean, just ask your own government secret service or your officials that are responsible for consolidating the information into theater theoretical assessments that gives options to take into account when the foretold moment comes at your doorstep, which is right now. And I don't think someone from another country should have the right to intervene on other sovereign countries at all. It's not my thing. I think they should mind their own business, but that's never been a strong point of the United States as you all probably know. Now, So what you're going to watch here, I hope that you like, subscribe, so that I can keep bringing more of this content to you, but we'll go over it piece by piece. There are a lot of pieces to this puzzle to put together here, and it starts slow and moves faster, And but what you're about to see, and I just want to once again tell you. These aren't my opinions that you're hearing on these floors. And I might even have to stop it once in a while to explain some things. I saw of you might understand what's going on, but a lot of you might not. So I'm going to be doing it for those that don't. If you do understand what's going on as you're hearing these congressional officers, some are going to say really bad things about Africa. Things that are going that they say behind closed doors. That when they get back up into the podium, if they're in front of the Africans, themselves in Africa, then they're all peachy keen, but this is the behind the scenes, what takes place. So let's do this. And I just want everybody in Africa to know I am praying for your continent in, in particular, Africa as the whole continent unity of one, one continent, a one people as, as the earth to me. I mean, we're all one people, uh, and I just want to say I'm praying for you and my heart's wishes and blessings go out to what's happening in Africa right now. Uh, so as we watch this together, and I'm sure a lot of your heads of state are going to get this too. Presidents, PMs, MPs across Africa will be watching this as well. And I want to say thank you for joining. Hopefully this helps. Let's go. In December... The government of Ghana demonstrated great leadership in advancing a successful United Nations Security Council resolution that would see Africa take greater ownership of its security by allowing resources to be redirected from the United Nations to African Union-led security missions. This is a significant development and a departure from long-standing U.S. policy that spans administrations. Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. The Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa and Subcommittee on Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organizations will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to examine the current state of U.S. policy toward U.N. peacekeeping missions and the future of peacekeeping operations in Africa. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. 
Last weekend, 30 people were killed in attacks in central Mali. Over 120 armed groups operate in eastern DRC, causing record displacement of civilians, and the Wagner Group is committing atrocities and dominates state institutions in the Central African Republic. These are all countries where multi-year, multi-billion dollar peacekeeping missions are or were recently deployed. Today's hearing is as much about the future of peacekeeping as it is about the reality of growing insecurity across the African continent. The failing of these peacekeeping missions leaves African countries with few alternatives. This has resulted in increased reliance on private military companies or bilateral deployment agreements with fellow African countries. These PMCs cover a spectrum from Wagner's neo-colonial model that trades in violence and uses blood gold to fund Putin's war in Ukraine to responsible companies, including American PMCs, that provide essential security and logistics services at U.S. embassies. I would like to better understand what is being done to kneecap Wagner's influence on the continent, where countries are looking for immediate solutions, and how the administration is approaching countries that want to engage responsible PMCs. These bilateral agreements, showcased by the successful deployments of Rwandan troops to Mozambique and the Central African Republic, demonstrate that African governments are taking security measures into their own hands. I look forward to hearing how the Department of State's Global Peace Operations Initiatives develops the critical mission capabilities of partner countries. In December, the government of Ghana demonstrated great leadership in advancing a successful United Nations Security Council resolution that would see Africa take greater ownership of its security by allowing resources to be redirected from the United Nations to African Union-led security missions. This is a significant development and a departure from long-standing U.S. policy that spans administrations. It is clear from my engagements with African governments that they share my concerns around how this new framework will operate in practice. The U.S. taxpayer is asked each year to support payments to the United Nations for peacekeeping missions that are increasingly viewed as irrelevant or worse to the national interests of these countries where they are mandated to restore peace and security. The future of these peacekeeping missions is the billion dollar question. And I look forward to the discussion today as we consider alternatives that may prove a greater success. That means ensuring the human rights standards at the AU reflect the UN standards and are effectively implemented during operations. We know that security forces abuse, abuses and human rights violations are some of the biggest drivers of violent extremism. That's why we need to make sure AU peace operations uphold human rights standards to maintain their legitimacy and to prevent them feeding into the very extremism they're aiming to curb of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to discuss how the Bureau of International Organization Affairs is defending American interests and working with our multilateral partners to tackle the global challenges of conflict, insecurity, human rights violations, and more. It's good to be with you to discuss the future of peacekeeping in Africa. An essential element of UN, AU, and sub-regional missions is that they include safeguards designed to promote respect for human rights, protection of civilians, and humanitarian access. Um, what, Assistant Secretary Sisson, are the steps being taken to make sure that the United Nations changes the level of assessed contributions for China and ends its treatment as a developed country? And what is the U.S. doing to support burden sharing for peacekeeping costs among our allies and partners? Thank you for that important question, Chairman. Listen, the U.S. has continually opposed the People's Republic of China's efforts to position itself as a developing country or as a champion for the developing world. We continue uh, in our engagements, not just in New York, but in uh, Geneva, Rome, elsewhere uh, in the UN capitals to increase awareness, particularly among the developing countries that the PRC, China, does not negotiate in resolutions at the UN with their best interests at heart. The PRC is the number two contributor of assessed contributions to the UN. Yes, but what are we doing, ma'am? What are we doing? We are there in New York in the budget committees. We are there in the UN Security Council in both the open and closed uh, discussions as we push to make sure that others realize that uh, China's self-identification as a developing country paying less than it really should is hurting other nations' best interests. Cool. Are this, you seeing any results? I believe that we have 
in the Budget Committee, the Fifth Committee of the UN, and then there's another oversight committee up in New York, increased awareness. There's a new reporting requirement, sir, uh, on uh, China's developing nation status. So you on the Hill are going to be seeing on a regular when? basis. Um, this is due to you middle of this year in the NDAA state authorization. This reporting requirement is a new one. You'll be getting the first report shortly. Sweet. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pratt, now countries in Africa that have contracted with Wagner and now a successor frequently state that in the face of existential security threats and failed or absent alternatives being offered from the West, Wagner is the only choice available to them to secure their security. Uh, do you agree that this is the reason uh, that CAR, CAR Mali uh, and others have turned to Wagner? Let, let me say first, um, th these are extremely difficult operating environments, um, as you well know. Um, part of the question revolves around uh, our own restrictions uh, in terms of um, 7008 restrictions on what we are able to do in those countries. Um, I, I believe that UN missions have been successful in addressing some of the concerns of those countries, but not all of them. Um, and I think there are other resources that those countries could draw on to solve those problems that would be much better than a Russian solution. So do you agree or disagree that this is a reason? Is it a reason or is it an excuse in your experience in those three particular countries? Um, I think it's a really complicated question and it's hard to address the security issues in those locations. All right. I, I actually think that um, it gives an out um, for people to skirt what we believe are the very basic standards of democracy, good governance, and human rights. I believe that other organizations are able to skirt that, uh, and the, uh, the leaders of these, of these states are taking advantage of being able to run around international law in a rules-based order. Uh, we must make sure that we stand by our allies and stand by human rights, democracy, and good governance, but the American people are beginning to question what we are getting in return for our great generosity. Uh, we need to, uh, the difference between investments and charity, uh, the line is accountability, transparency, and results. And the American people are not seeing the results. And uh, so hopefully in the minutes in, uh, that we have in here, you can give us better answers than maybe, and it's complicated. We know it's complicated, but you're here to help us find answers so we can support the overall mission. I reintroduced my bill, uh, the United States Commitment to Peacekeeping Act, that would repeal our 25% cap on U.S. contributions and allow the U.S. to pay its full dues. Um, it also encourages the U.S. mission to redouble its efforts to make progress on a range of peacekeeping reform initiatives. Um, Assistant Secretary Sisson, do you think this proposal would be useful for advocating for U.S. priorities at the U.N.? And if so, why? It's a very important question. It's uh, really important that we take these steps to meet our financial obligations, particularly when our strategic competitors, but PRC, China, is at the top of the list here, use this against us uh, not only in open sessions of the Budget Committee, but believe me, behind our backs when they are talking to and with developing countries. So our job is to lead at the UN. Our job is to push the UN to be better. Uh, through reforms to make the UN better, we've got to not only be there at the table, we've got to have that credibility. So we need to push back against the PRC. We need to pay our bills in full and on time. We're in January now. This conversation with you is an important milestone, as is the AU Summit. Thank you. And if you could emphasize with your African interlocutors uh, how important it is on a bipartisan way, bicameral way, uh, that these issues be addressed very robustly. You know, I often find uh, that there's lip service by some, and I'm not saying they're paying lip service to it, but, and then when it gets down to, is it really serious? Are you really committed? Do you care for that 13-year-old who's about to get raped and abused? Um, well, we have to, and we do, and I know you do, so please do everything you can to let them know how important we think it is in the U.S. Congress. And I would say that's the executive branch view as well, but they need to know that we care about that uh, very, very seriously. Thank you. Yes, sir. And on that question of does the AU understand this, that is why this took so long, getting the AU to sign on to its own framework on the conduct and discipline. This sexual exploitation and abuse trafficking of persons is part of that. Thank you. Well, they're going to need to put their money where their mouth is. Um, the chair now recognizes Ms. Wild. Thank you very much. Um, I want to question, I have questions for both of you, so I'm going to kind of combine it all and then let you answer. Um, I mentioned uh, at the, in my opening remarks UN Security Council Resolution 2719 
and the importance in, of expanding UNAU uh, cooperation. Um, Assistant Secretary Sisson, I'd like you to speak to the significance of the resolution and its implementation. Ambassador Pratt, can you speak to the importance of supporting the strengthening of AU-led peace support mission capacity across the continent? And either or both of you, can you touch on why a robust U.S. commitment to peacekeeping is critical specifically for countering malign Russian influence in conflict areas? Thank you. So on this new resolution, uh, 2719, and again, it's great to be here today to get your input um, directly. Um, you know, African countries were demanding new tools. We worked with the AU to come up with this framework. Um, it is a framework. Um, now we've got to go to implementation. But we agree that what we were seeing in the field uh, was beyond what traditional UN peacekeeping was set up to do, the violent extremism, the non-state actors, the use of IEDs, the disinformation. Uh, so these African Union peace support operations that now will be partially funded once authorized by the UN Security Council, um, they reflect the need for African leadership. Um, you know, it's clear that UN peacekeeping didn't have all of the answers. Um, we will um, be looking uh, as, as Jonathan had also mentioned, uh, where does this make sense? Where can the troops deploy rapidly? This is what we've seen, the value added of the AU's own peace support operations and the regional operations, the regional economic Rex operations. Over the last 30 years, we've seen about 38 of these regional operations. They're often able to deploy very quickly, but they didn't have that predictable financial uh, Capability. They didn't have that sustained financing. So they fell down after a quick launch. They weren't able to meet their mandates. Or the logistics piece didn't fully support the mandate. So that's where we're going to have to focus. On, on I'm going to stop you there for a second because I want to give Ambassador yeah. Pratt an opportunity here, if you could, sir. Um, I think that's exactly right what the Assistant Secretary is saying. We want to be able to work with, with sub-regional organizations to be more nimble if they have an AU mandate. Um, and I think they'll be able to respond more quickly. Historically, as I said in my statement, we've been able to support um, African countries in training and equipping themselves and ensuring that they've got safeguards uh, in terms of their behavior and conduct in these locations. Um, part of the hearing is also focused on uh, how we use companies to fulfill some of the logistical and training roles, and we've done that successfully in several locations. And could either both of you just comment briefly on um, the... Uh, importance of this commitment for countering malign Russian influence? So when we saw the um, host country consent disappear in Mali for the UN peacekeeping mission, um, and I traveled out to Mali a couple of years ago myself to, to look how, at how that operation was going, um, you know, I, I fear the worst for the civilian population of Mali. I do not believe that the um, transitional government had that uh, interest at heart when they brought in Wagner and, and pushed out the, uh, the peacekeeping mission. But now we've got um, this new tool uh, to look at where we can uh, deploy African peacekeepers with this new use of UNSS funding for the AUP support operations. I believe that the African neighbors, the African partners, are heavily invested. In fact, they've been heavily invested um, all along. When uh, you look at the deployment of African peacekeepers at the UN peacekeeping operations, uh, the number of fatalities. There's been a lot said right now. I haven't jumped in. Excuse me for taking my jacket off. I was getting warm. But if you notice what she is just said that with the Wagner group in Africa, the Russians, the UN is working on with other uh, UN allies in Africa, peacekeepers. They're calling them peacekeepers and what peacekeepers sometimes would mean would be, uh, People who were keeping peace, making sure, I, I mean, the way they're talking about Wagner right here 
and they're putting Africans military in there, another proxy thing. The U.S. loves to do this. Uh, have the Africans fight against other Africans and just get, pay them money. I'm not saying that is exactly what we're hearing here. I don't want to discount anything, though. You always prepare for the worst, but I haven't chimed in yet, and I figured I would chime in just to let you know that I'm here listening with you. But uh, that right there, I don't know what it sounds like to me, is uh, they're seeing Russia moving into Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, uh, and they're taking steps with other ally countries that are allied to America, maybe ECOWAS. They didn't say that, but just maybe. And making sure that they're, they've got a military strong enough to defeat uh, other militaries. That's so far. And uh, hopefully you're enjoying this. Like, subscribe, and uh, we're going to continue moving forward with this. <sighs> are heavily invested. In fact, they've been heavily invested um, all along. When uh, you look at the deployment of African peacekeepers at the UN peacekeeping operations, uh, the number of fatalities, for example, last year, 56 of the 66 were actually in these uh, African uh, peacekeeping missions. So the 25% the, um, the burden sharing is there. but putting their men and women on the front lines in these operations is also extremely significant, and we are partnering with them to lift up these priorities in their own regions. Uh, I now recognize Chairwoman Kim for five minutes of questions. Okay. Well, I want to thank the witnesses for joining us today. The UN Security Council Resolution 2719 allows for consideration of UN fi uh, financing of AU-led peacekeeping missions. This provides a framework to a needed security alternative to the current options, but the resolution left out a lot of important details unanswered, most uh, pertinently around the role of the African Union. This resolution includes a burden sharing aspect of uh, aspect with UN funding being capped at 75%. This is an amendment I understand the United States led. However, I'm concerned that leaving the question of where the additional 25% of funding will come from to a case-by-case -case basis will hamper the ability of this framework to be efficiently deployed. The African Union has well-documented financial and logistical challenges. The AU Peace Fund has not yet reached its 400 million uh, fundraising goal and the absence of any major AU-led peace operations to address the conflicts in Ethiopia and Sudan illustrates the AU's limited intervention capability. So Assistant Secretary Sison, where do you expect this additional 25% of funding to come from? And what have you heard from African partner countries on this requirement? Now, it's an important question, and that burden sharing, um, as I said, was, was a key piece of this negotiation in December um, up in New York. Um, but again, this 25% is the AU contribution. It is in-kind contributions, and we expect the UN member states and the AU member states to go out to other countries, to others, and look for voluntary contributions. And I think that should not be underestimated. The United States is not the only um, country in the world that really is very concerned about these complex crises, the violent extremist organizations, the terrorists um, operating in a number of locations in Africa. So I do believe that other countries are going to come up and support. For what I'm reading, the president of South Sudan is very determined to hold these historic elections. UN MIS has assessed that several conditions must be in place by April 2024 to hold elections by December. If those conditions are not met, is it, it is unclear how the mission will proceed. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Pratt, if you, UN MIS assesses the elections are not feasible, would you recommend to the government to postpone the elections again? I agree with you. Condition Welcome to the meeting where the United States 
gets involved in other elections and lets other countries know you can vote this way. This is how you're going to do it. If you can't vote the other way or we're going to get involved. Another overstepping of their boundaries, I think, but I don't know exactly what's going on in Sudan, how bad it is, but is it the United States business? Honestly, once again, these are what's going on behind closed doors. It's, Open to the public, don't get me wrong, but you got to dig deep for this information so deep that they don't want you to find it. But when you find it, it usually is too late. Here we found it, we caught it early. So Um, this is just one other example right here, what you're seeing of America's involvement where maybe it shouldn't be. Let me know what you think. And keep on going. This is, it still gets, it has some pretty, uh, chunky pieces of information here. So hopefully you're enjoying or paying attention at least. ...have to be in place for the election. And we would be very concerned with a scenario where support uh, and funding goes into uh, a mission uh, when they're not ready for for that election. And so um, we need to see the conditions in place for, for that election to occur. If they insist, how can the U.S. assist them? I think there are a lot of tools that are at our disposal, especially diplomatic pressure and political pressure from all of the partners. Um, It's been an extremely uh, challenging scenario that that you described in order to get them to those outcomes, but I think we have to have teeth uh, behind the tools that we're deploying uh, to get them to move to prepare properly. UN Mrs. Mandate is up for renewal in the UN Security Council in March. As discussions around the mandate renewal continues, how is the U.S. working to ensure that UMIS has tools, resources, and authorities necessary to mitigate the risk of violence before, during, and after these potential elections? A recent hardship to peacekeeping missions has been eroding host country consent. How can the U.S. government and international bodies and partners better recognize the signs and respond to concerns before relationships erode to the point of mission conclusion and draw down. It is a really important question and I'll tell you at that African uh, peacekeeping ministerial at the National Defense University Force Commanders Roundtable this was probably the number one uh, topic of conversation. Um, Earlier news to us when things look like they're going south so we can also go in there and um, engage um, on these questions but this also goes back to look at what these strategic competitors are doing and here we're going back to the Wagner question. Clearly some of these countries are not interested in protecting civilians. Some of these countries are more interested in corrupt mining deals um, or, or other Uh, reasons to have Wagner and and similar um, uh, non-state actors in there. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pratt, uh, what other factors would you add to that in uh, in Mali or Somalia or the uh, DRC are contributing to the erosion of host country support for peacekeeping missions? I'll start with the DRC. Uh, I'm more, more familiar with that situation. Uh, I think there are, are regional political concerns uh, and um, tensions b- uh, between especially Rwanda and, and Congo. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think, unfortunately, the uh, UN mission there has, has been um, politicized to some degree. But I'm confident that both uh, sides uh, continue to see value uh, in the mission and playing specific roles that can be defined in terms of verification, monitoring, and implementation of a peace agreement. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, I think as they see value in the mission, um, there will be uh, continued consent. There is an ongoing discussion, as you know, on the MUNISCO mission mm-hmm. on a responsible uh, uh, drawdown. Um, and we're encouraging uh, that very much to make sure that um, we're not losing tools that could be very valuable. Um, the situation in Mali is, is much uh, more complicated. Um, because uh, the government essentially uh, lost confidence in their ability to carry out the mission against very um, challenged counterterrorism environment. Um, 
And, and so that, that was a, an unfortunate decision because that mission, as you know, was implementing a, a broader peace agreement with the Algiers Accord. So it's, it's an unfortunate loss, uh, frankly. Okay. Um, and, and so uh, what specific tools are you using to make sure you are, you are actually recouping some of the assets that are there? We've uh, worked directly with the uh, United Nations, and I defer as well to the Assistant Secretary to, to address the question, but we've pushed them uh, directly to ensure that they're uh, removing all of the equipment that they possibly can, that it's uh, feasible and cost-effective financially to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, how does Congress's failure to appropriate sufficient funding to pay our peacekeeping dues in full and address our obligations to the United Nations in the arrear affect our peacekeeping ability in Africa? And in leading, and as we push the UN to do better, and as we push the UN to reform, if we haven't paid what we owe in full and on time, our credibility is undercut. And particularly, People's Republic of China will not hesitate to call us out, whether it's in a budget meeting or uh, in, in their conversations where we are not present. Thank you. Can you point to any disinformation campaigns that are currently going on on the continent that um, we should be apprised of? Uh, there, there are a number of, of very uh, pernicious uh, campaigns uh, going on. Um, I mean, one was uh, that had to do with, for example, in, in Mali, the, the effectiveness of, of that mission there, the UN mission. Um, and I think there, uh, a lot of the information campaign that the Russians were pushing around this is, is one of the factors that drove uh, the government to ask for the, the mission's withdrawal. Is this creating a um, uh, more hostility between the African government and the UN peacekeeping troops? Uh, well, I, I think we've seen the example of, a very unfortunate example of Mali. Uh, where they lost a tool that that could be very could have been very valuable uh, and was playing a positive role and so so yes that's an example uh, a, a very tangible one of where we lost an important mission um, thank you mr. Jackson I now recognize congressman McCormick for five minutes thank you mr. chair so you I was gonna go a totally different line of questioning but you brought up an interesting point about paying our dues and about our participation in the United Nations. Uh, my first interaction with the United Nations was in 1994 in Operation Restore Hope. Uh, as you may remember, famously we withdrew from Rwanda and because some UN peacekeeping troops were killed and about a million people were killed shortly thereafter. Not a very good peacekeeping mi mission. And that was my first taste of the United Nations. Since that time, I'm sure you're aware of the accusations of thousands of child trafficking accusations against the United Nations troops uh, of, of sex for food and, and other problems, theft, murder, embezzlement, including people who are in the hierarchy of the United Nations themselves with very little accountability, I might add. You talked about how important it is to pay our dues. 28% of the United Nations is what we pay. And uh, I think that's around 13 billion per year right now probably averaged around thir uh, 10 billion over the last, since 1994 when I was there, which means around $300 billion that we paid to the United Nations. Now what we've gotten out of that in Africa and other places is a continued decline of United States representation in the United Nations as China continues to supplant us throughout Africa when these countries are voting against us actively that they're taking China's side constantly in United Nations votes as well as their demeanor, as well as their support for people who are not only anti-US, but also anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, going against our own strategic views worldwide. I'm not really sure why we have to make sure that the United States is paying our dues when the United Nations continues to be increasingly anti-US interest. And what upsets me is when you look at the, the development of China uh, and their influence, and we already had Russian influence in Africa, I would say that both Russia and China are more influential in Africa than we are already. And certainly with that deterioration of the United Nations influence, where you have also, I believe, over 10,000 Chinese firms now operating throughout the continent, 
uh, of the 54 countries in Africa, five have any diplomatic relationships with another ally or strategic interest partner, Taiwan. Uh, 25 countries backed China over the Hong Kong national security law in 2020. In 2019, countries in Africa constituted about half of the 37 nations on a letter defending China and the Uyghur genocide. Clearly, we're losing our influence on the world stage. And not only are we losing our influence, but we're funding it to the tune of 28% and 13 billion per year. So I want you to defend your statement when you say it's important to pay our dues to an organization that I'm seeing becoming more increasingly uh, contrary to our strategic goals. Of course, we share those costs in UN peacekeeping missions with other member states. So the most recent, 2018, GA I'm sorry, we're about to run out of time. And I, actually, you're making good points. And I'll give you credit for that. Uh, but what I will say is that if we're going to do our far, fair chart and, and fair part in funding the United Nations, they have to be far more accountable to our interests, not just in peacekeeping, but in everything they do. And I mean everything they do, because we've also seen them support people who actually actively participate in war against our allies, including Hamas, which just came up. So I just want to make the point that just because you do some good doesn't mean you necessarily align with our strategic outlook. And if we're going to bear the burden of the vast preponderance of funding this organization, it needs to come more in line with what we're trying to achieve. And with that, I yield. Thank you, Mr. McCormick, for your very important salient questions. I now recognize Congressman Baird for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate our witnesses being here. Uh, you know, the United States, kind of to what my colleague just talked about, is the largest contributor to the UN peacekeeping. And in fiscal year 22, 1.3 billion was contributed to the four largest missions, all of which were in Africa. So Assistant Terry, Secretary Sasson, do you feel that the investment into these peacekeeping missions is a responsible use of taxpayer funds when the missions fail to restore peace and order, which is kind of like what my colleague just asked. And again, these African countries, to go back to the use of UNSS funding for AU peace operations, they are asking for our help. They are asking for our help. And I think that is an important partnership aspect we need to consider, sir. Uh, could I ask, does that, do, do these actions help us counteract uh, what the Chinese Communist Party uh, is doing in some of these countries? So when we see uh, the Chinese come in, um, it is often um, based on a deal, a road construction, mining, a specific commercial deal. Um, it is true that China has come in bigger uh, to the UN in terms of what they are contributing, uh, both monetarily and I will point out also uh, peacekeeping personnel. We want to lift up why we're here. We're here to protect civilians. We're here with peacekeeping uh, to keep these humanitarian access corridors open for badly needed food, medicine, and so forth. Uh, we are not interested in sending peacekeeping missions out to look for uh, you know, the mining deal. So I think as we point out what our intentions are and what those are of some of our strategic competitors, um, our, our developing country um, partners uh, do see a difference. I am going to say what she just said in plain English. China is kicking America's tail in relationships with Africa because they're paying more money, building more roads, making more deals, fair deals. Now, there's more to this. And as you've heard a lot of information that when you put it all in a ball, when you consolidate it all together, you've got a picture of what's going on with the UN, United States as well, and the major factor in Africa. And it looks like right now there's a tearing. But if you've listened to a few parts in there, even when the gentleman said we need to show our teeth, that's never a good sign. That's not a good sign. 
means usually force, you know. And um, I want to know, I'm, there's more to this. I'm going to put the other piece to the, of this together, the other half. There's another like 30 minutes, but I got to make it. I'll put it up in another video in lieu of your time. This video is getting very long, put it that way. And now you know where Africa stands as far as the USA is concerned, where I mean, United States and Africa together stand. And there was a lot of messaging in there going on in between, is America gonna fund Africa's part? Is America gonna pay Africa's portion? Which in a way shows me that Africa really doesn't care too much for the UN to be like, we don't even wanna pay it. We don't want, maybe they just don't want the UN there. And I know that there's some countries out there, you know which countries you are, out there that are gonna just take the money, take the money, let them in, let them in, which is good. If it's good for your country, great. Take the money and let them in, let them support. Nothing wrong with that. But if the money's going into the land of Africa, let it go into the land of Africa, not into the public officials and president's pockets and bank accounts, which we've seen a lot of not going to call out any of you countries out there. You get mad at me, I know. I don't even know if they're going to let this video in to many parts of Africa. I don't think so. I don't think they will. Or hopefully the United States lets it out. Who knows? But I'll put the other one up too. And uh, let me know what you guys think. I personally uh, cringed during a lot of what they were talking about. It just hard to stomach when you hear United States talking about what they're going to do for Africa, in Africa, and how they want Africa to act. It doesn't sit right with me. And I know it doesn't sit right with those Africans out there. People, citizens of Africa, don't like it, and I don't blame them. Like and subscribe, guys, and once you get the other half of this, we'll have the bigger picture. So let me know what you think. Have a blessed day. Praying for you. Bye-bye.